You want third world treatment? You got it. Boy, is it hot here in Johnny. You can't demand to be treated like any third world sick person and call a press conference. They treat me special. That doesn't mean I am. House is arguing that Dr. Sebastian is cheapening their suffering by choosing to forego privileges that are so easily accessible to him. But does any of it matter if TB isn't the cause of his symptoms anyway? Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 2, Episode 4, TB or Not TB. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 House videos, and this will be Episode 53. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. Sebastian. Pallets antibiotics for tuberculosis. We've got six pallets worth of patients. Quick, quick, let's move. Imagine going to your local hospital and being told, sorry, there's no medication. You need to go to a big hospital instead. That's actually a frequent occurrence in some rural parts of Africa is to the extent that even though Africans make up only 15% of the world's population, 50 percent of the world's children under five who die from treatable or preventable conditions like pneumonia, malaria, diarrhea, measles, HIV, TB are in Africa. Part of the problem is that only 2% of medications consumed in Africa are actually produced there, meaning they rely on expensive intercontinental imports to get the meds they need. The likelihood is though that you're not watching from Africa, and even if you are, we may have a bigger problem on our hands very soon, bacterial evolution. You see, the last time we discovered a new antibiotic class was in the 1980s. That means we have no real new weapons to throw at resistant bacteria now. We're already seeing the effects of this as 30% of newborns with sepsis die to bacterial infections that are resistant to multiple first line antibiotics. So we've thrown the net out far and wide in the natural world looking for the dirtiest organisms that somehow stay alive. Don't worry, I'm not talking about your favorite OnlyFans model. We've looked at snakes which feast on infected rodents and stay healthy, cockroaches that eat almost anything and are famously resilient. Unlike all those whiny junior doctors asking for a pay rise for luxuries like shoebox rent and cold baked beans, our beans were never baked. You had to pick them yourselves and grind them up with willpower, broken dreams and syphilis. So even checking those dirty organisms, we haven't found a new class of antibiotics since the 1980s. Maybe AI will have the answer or maybe it will want us to get wiped out by multi-resistant bacteria so it can take over the planet. Either way, let's find out more. Help! Dr. Sebastian! My son, he fell. He fell on this log. I got no breath sounds on the left. Give me that. Yeah, he's gonna be okay. The lung caused him to fall. TB chewed it up. All of the antibiotics that we need are right here. Now, we all know pharmaceutical companies aren't exactly the second coming of Gandhi, but this reminds me of a scandal worse than simply holding drugs to Africans, which seems like it's happening here. Now, you may remember that many babies in recent history have been given talcum powder as a way to stop nappy rash. In 2022, the company that makes it announced they would discontinue it globally. The reason they had 40,000 lawsuits against them alleging that it caused ovarian cancer or mesothelioma, that's because it was contaminated with a Bestus, a molecule known to cause cancer, but the company said it was a commercial decision to withdraw the product because of a worldwide portfolio assessment. Okay, now it's important to note that it isn't actually surprising that the talc product also contained asbestos since the minerals are naturally found close together and 14% of talc-based products contain detectable levels of asbestos when you run the research. Now, if you thought that Johnson & Johnson selling a known carcinogen as baby powder wasn't bad enough, this is gonna knock you off your seat. They are still providing African countries with talc-based baby powder, even though they promise to stop. Madness. Okay, let's see what's going on with these TB meds. We provide over 10,000 doses. You have to push a little bit harder. Isn't someone here a doctor? Doctor, on a pharmaceutical board, 
Where would the fun in that be? Spoiling the party with their dry talk on things like ethics, research bias, and patient safety. Like they'd be fun at parties. In all seriousness, not all pharmaceutical companies are inherently evil. It's just some of the business tactics some of them use that are questionable. We very much need pharmaceutical companies to fuel new discoveries. And that is part of the problem with antibiotics. The chance of finding a new breakthrough is so small, and then the profit margin wouldn't be that high afterwards. It's horrible to look at like this, but with a medication like an antibiotic, there's no recurring cost generally. You give the patient the medicine, then they're either fixed or not fixed. Both ways, they're probably not going to need it again. Medicines with recurring costs are much more profitable like chemotherapy or immunosuppression, which is part of the reason why there have been hundreds of discoveries in those fields in recent years. When you look behind the curtain and see how the world works, it's easy to see how reality will be less popular than VR headsets. Now, Dr. Sebastian seems to have collapsed in a pretty non-specific way, so we definitely need more clues. Exciting though, this is the first episode that a doctor is the patient, and we're not easy patients. Dr. Sebastian Charles collapsed during a presentation at Stoya Tucker. Crushed under the weight of his own ego. He thinks it's TB. How saying someone else is crushed under the weight of her own ego is like a patient I had who was complaining both her boyfriends were cheating on her. Now TB or tuberculosis is a very interesting disease with some special characteristics. It's caused by a bacterium known as Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's usually inhaled and makes its way straight down the lungs to the body's first line of defense, the macrophages. Usually these will find the bacteria and break it down, but what Mycobacterium tuberculosis does so masterfully is stop that from happening. The macrophage usually uses a type of bleach in an organelle known as a lysosome, but TB stops the host signal for this to be deployed, sort of like an atomic EMP. The bacteria is then free to replicate and the macrophage sends out distress signals asking for help. The immune cells then surround the bacteria, creating something called a granuloma, but there are loads of diseases that can cause them. And this doctor seems like he could have been exposed to freshwater parasites like schistosomiasis or cat scratch disease from cats, measles or even histoplasmosis. I very much want to see his chest x-ray right now because TB does have a very characteristic appearance. We can also do an indicative blood test called a quantiferon, which has replaced the old Mantu test where you put a small blob of mycobacterial antigen under the skin and see if it swells up. If it did, then it was positive. You'd also want to send off some phlegm for culture, but that does take a few weeks. Okay, give us some clues. It's not TB. I'm uh, Sebastian Charles. Patients aren't usually part of the diagnostic process. Listen, I, I know you guys don't make a lot of money. I wrote your people a check last month. I love how House just blanked him after he offered the handshake. Must be following COVID regs. This case reminds me of a colleague who I've been working with recently. Every day, he runs his clinic seeing 30 patients a day, blood pressures, blood tests, and minimum five healthy lifestyle discussions of daily themes. It wasn't until he was suffering from a throbbing headache that our practice nurse mentioned, have you done your own blood pressure recently? He hadn't over four years. Normal clinic blood pressure should be under 140 over 90, and his was 195 over 120, exorbitantly high. The problem isn't just with physical health though. Doctors have one of the highest rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, burnout, and substance misuse amongst any professional. It's emotionally demanding work, but working beyond usual shift times, understaffing, difficulty making time for exercise or relaxation and skipping meals definitely have a part to play. Speaking of relaxation, it seems like Dr. Sebastian over here, even after collapsing and being an inpatient in hospital, is still gunning for charity donations. Brilliant. It's TB. Nope. His symptoms are too varied. I told you he's an idiot. I do suspute him to confirm the TB. I think we should probably take a CT scan of my lungs just so that nobody second guesses us. Well, after that, it seems Dr. House needs a collection of his own to win his team's loyalty back. Now, some extra information we've gotten is that Dr. Sebastian is an immunologist, TB expert, and has seen 10,000 cases of TB so far. Interestingly though, immunologists don't treat TB. Infectious diseases experts treat TB, of which House is one. There was a time though where there were no specialists in TB, which was as recent as the 18th century. The illness was even 
even known in England and France as the king's evil because people thought it could only be healed after a royal touch. Must have been disappointed when all they got was herpes. It wasn't until Robert Koch discovered that he could isolate the mycobacterium in the 1880s that we understood what actually caused the disease. That led to huge advances like tuberculin skin tests, BCG vaccine, and Selman Waxman's discovery of streptomycin, which cured a TB patient for the first time in 1949. Earlier we mentioned specialties, but I wonder what specialty could treat Dr. Seb's inevitably bruised ego after he goes against House's opinion. I'm still trying to repair mine on all the diagnoses I've missed, but I'm confident we'll get this one. You've forgotten all about doing a differential diagnosis. Get him out of there. TB takes years to kill you. Two weeks ago, he was perfectly healthy. Now he's got a whiteboard full of symptoms. We have some symptoms. On the whiteboard, House was talking about is vertigo, blurred vision, and confusion. I think he's blocking half the board. Now, House also made a comment about the patient smelling like an elephant dung smoothie. Dr. Sebastian says it's his body powder, but what if it's actually a sign? Put all of the symptoms with lung disease, and it could be a condition called trimethylamineurea. That is a genetic disease which causes a foul-smelling chemical called trimethylamine to build up smelling like rotten fish. You could test it with a urine test, but there is unfortunately no treatment. So it's probably not that, but it is a very interesting diagnosis to mention. Other adult onset metabolic diseases could fit as well, like homocysteine remethylation disorder and ureal cycle deficits. Could check an ammonia level and serum homocysteine levels to rule them out. House did touch on something interesting here as well. He spoke about how the patient was well two weeks ago and now is quite unwell. We use timescales quite frequently like that in medicine to try and figure out what type of disease process this is. Like vascular conditions tend to be a sudden decline in function, then a slow improvement. Cancers are the opposite with slow initial onset and accelerated decline as things progress. Infection can't really be mapped onto a chart like this because there's too much variety. But House is right to say that TB is an exceptional slow growing disease and so it would be unlikely to cause a decline this suddenly. Believe it or not, TB is the infective disease that kills the most people worldwide annually with around 1.6 million lives each year claimed by the disease. So a question for you smart people, what is the second leading infectious disease cause of death over the last year? Answers down below. What about something metabolic? It's not metabolic. Kidney, liver, and thyroid are all normal. What about his heart? Waveforms show PR variability. I'll put him on telemetry, do a stress test, and an echocardiogram. Whoa, Cameron is very keen to treat this guy. What's better than fixing a broken man? A broken man who fixes other broken people. Now, I'm very much liking this metabolic theory Chase suggested, but they seem to have gone way off topic with the heart rate. Chase said the ECG showed PR variability. Now, this would be very easy to spot, as what he's getting at is a subtype of type two heart block called Mobitz 1. The distance between the P wave and the QRS complex, which we call the PR interval, get wider and wider until there's actually a dropped heartbeat. That can indicate that something is blocking the conduction of signals from the top of the heart to the bottom. Drugs are common causes like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or something called amiodarone. I once had a 47 year old patient on cardiac surgery that developed an abnormal heart rhythm after surgery and had complete blockage of signals from the top of the heart to the bottom. A normal heart rate is more than 60 and his was a whopping 27. We had to externally pace him immediately and he was on both amiodarone and beta blockers. So we had to stop the beta blockers and he recovered fairly quickly. Very close. I think this is a red herring. I see your distraction techniques universal, but did you know that I have the attention of a chess master on Ritalin? Do I smell Cinnabon bun? You're just mad because he's closer to a Nobel Prize than you are. Nobel invented dynamite. I won't accept his blood money. Oh, now there's an interesting piece of history. The Nobel Prize was first awarded in 1901 based on Alfred Nobel's will from 1896. His last wishes were that five separate prizes were awarded to those who during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. The categories are physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature and peace. The funding came from his remaining realizable assets. Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist, engineer, and industrialist who did invent dynamite, but also 300 
and 54 other inventions. The majority of his fortunes came from the top three inventions, dynamite, a blasting cap to trigger an explosion, and gelignite, which can't explode without a detonator. All of that sounds fairly destructive, but Nobel did this because he thought his innovations would benefit humankind. He was strongly anti-war, saying that he dreamed of making a substance of such frightful efficacy for wholesale destruction that would make wars impossible. Good strategy, I suppose. There won't be any way to wage war if we just blow everyone up. He left a fortune of over $100 million in today's money, which is invested in stable assets and continues to fund the prizes, which are around 1 million US dollars each. So time to start a campaign for house reaction videos to be a category. The top of my head's killing me. Ow! Your sinuses are clogged. Judging by the scratches on your hands, I'm guessing a new cat. You're allergic. We can control it with antihistamine. Pills? Is there something else you can give me? Well, if you live by the river, I've got a bag. I've got a bag! I've got a bag! Good thing House's medical license is more resilient than Wellwitchia mirabilis, a plant which can live for up to 2,000 years. Now the top of her head that she was talking about could have been the frontal sinuses being congested. That is alongside the maxillary sinuses that House pressed. That pain that's felt though isn't triggered by allergic rhinitis, which is what House was saying the patient has. It's from acute bacterial sinusitis most commonly, which she would be less concerned about the top of her her head pain and more with the buckets of pus leaking from her nose. Treatment would also be with antibiotics instead of throwing your cat in the river. A subtle but important difference. Now I really want to know the results of these waste of time heart tests. Stress test was normal. That goes normal. Tilt table tests. You like this guy? You figure anybody who gives a crap about people in Africa must be full of it? Yes. So the great humanitarians as selfish as the rest of us. Just not as honest about it. Does true altruism exist? House is perfectly demonstrating the argument of psychological altruism versus psychological egoism. So psychological altruism is the motivation to increase another person's well-being, and psychological egoism would argue that we would only want to do good for others if it benefits ourselves. That is, you can still want to help an old lady cross the road, but you'd probably want to do it to impress the girl walking the other way. Or you'll jump on a grenade to save your squadron, but you'll do it for the status of feeling good or obtaining the status of a hero. So which one is it? Can we truly do things for the genuine intention to benefit others? We can tackle it from an evolutionary biology, economics, or psychological perspective. You see, in biology, it isn't just humans that act to help others. Ants have almost no personal lives, devoting all of their lives to ensuring the colony survives. Or whales, who've actually been observed adopting a dolphin into their group for some time. Or vampire bats that will regurgitate blood to another vampire bat that hasn't eaten that day. Scientists can explain some of these things through the idea that a genetic relative of that animal is more like to survive through their own sacrifice. This is explained by the theory of inclusive fitness proposed by someone called William Hamilton. He changed Darwin's theory from just natural selection to natural selection favoring genetic success, not just reproductive success of the individual per se. That theory doesn't explain though why the whales in 2013 adopted a dolphin. Biology further extends to humans as very altruistic animals in nature, with many scientists believing that we evolved our exceptionally smart brains in response to the overwhelming benefits of engaging in selfless behavior. That's because it's so difficult to think of actually doing things for others, so just ask any toddler. So an economic perspective states that to help yourself, you have to help the less fortunate, even if they are in a country you've never heard of. That's because we no longer live in a pre-industrial world where resources are limited by agricultural land space. After the industrial revolution, economic growth has been so rapid that you can take a bigger piece of pie and so can someone else. Before, if you were taking a bigger slice of the economic pie, you'd be giving someone else a smaller one, but now both of you can have a bigger slice due to the rapid growth and it's called a positive sum game. 
rather than a zero-sum game. So by helping others, the demand for the new innovative ideas goes up, the ability to implement them does too, and so does market demand for a particular product or service. We can visualize how quickly we've advanced just thinking about how our priorities have changed over time. 250 years ago, you may have hoped for a sturdy pair of shoes. In the 1860s, you would have hoped for a bicycle, 1930s, a car, 1980s, cheap plane tickets. And in 2023, we want self-actualization, intellectual stimulation, and enough time to enjoy it all. The rising tide lifts all boats. If more people are there to benefit and fund cures for cancer and research into human longevity, everyone will benefit. A psychological perspective could stem from Jungian theory. It explains that the highest point of existence is understanding you are the same as the world. That the world doesn't actually exist without you. What's good for you is good for the world. Part of that is because the shadow of your mind or the collective unconscious you have is the same as the collective unconscious that another human has. It's an inherited set of underlying programming that runs your human processing that you don't even think about. So there's no way of not being altruistic because if something is good for you, then it's also good for the world as well. Now, a question for you smart people, with all of that context that I mentioned, do you think that true altruism exists? Answers down below. What does this knobby thing do? Imagine what it'll tell you if you crank it to 10. Charles, is that you? All right, I'm beginning to feel nauseous. I can't see, and I'm gonna pass out. I win. The test revealed a problem. They're right, the ECG revealed a diagnosis. Dr. Seb is an alien. You see, in a human, the leads on an ECG read the heart all at the same time, but in different directions. The general electrical activity of the heart can only go in one direction, and it stays together that way, unlike the band. We call that direction the cardiac axis, and normally it runs between minus 30 and 90 degrees. Minus 30 is up your left arm and 90 degrees your feet. Now let's say the cardiac axis or general electrical activity of the heart is plus 30 degrees. Lead AVR is facing minus 150 degrees. So when you look at AVR on the ECG trace, it will be pointing downwards. Lead two, on the other hand, is close to plus 30, running at plus 60, so that will face upwards on the ECG trace. As you go around the leads from two to AVR, you'll see that the size of the wave will get progressively smaller and eventually become negative. So if you look at a normal ECG, you'll see that each of the leads has an R wave, either pointing generally up or generally down, which changes with each of the leads. You'll also see that the point which the heart beats, which is each of the spikes is vertically aligned across the leads. With that in mind, what about Dr. Sebastian's trace? Each of the leads is pointing exactly the same amount of up. They're not aligned vertically and have varying gaps in the PR interval. Each of them looks like it's hooked onto a different patient. The point at which house is pointing to the abnormality also seems to be the only part of the ECG that's actually normal. Other obvious abnormalities are that lead two has a very strong PR interval interval, and then V3 and AVR have a very short interval. Also, the heart rates seem to be different on each lead. One looks normal, AVR looks slow. Also, it's much easier to read these when you have little pink small squares, then you can do some calculations. In all fairness though, I don't think they put this on screen expecting me to sit and actually read it. And it's quite funny to watch House crank the tilt table so high that Seb shakes off his human costume. Let's see what the writers want this to be. Need more clues. You've got an abnormal PR interval. I'm gonna need a pacemaker. We're scheduled for surgery this afternoon. Pacemaker for that ECG. It's like going to the doctor with a cold and getting your lung removed. There are two common indications for a pacemaker. The first is sinus dysfunction. There is a node at the top of the heart, which is like a metronome because it keeps the beat. <laughs> that was such a dad joke. So that node reliably pushes out an electrical signal every couple of seconds and tells the heart it's time to beat. Sometimes this node channels its inner junior doctor and decides to go on strike. We call that sick sinus syndrome. 
Another indication for pacemaker is severe heart block. What we're showing on this patient's trace is first degree heart block at maximum. That is actually present in one in 20 men above 60 who walk around with it having no symptoms or problems. The problems occur if it progresses to higher grade blocks, but that is extremely rare. I guess you could say maybe he's doing it just to hedge against the risk that sometimes may happen out there, but then he should also wrap himself in bubble wrap and cut out his appendix. Wouldn't make for much drama though, would it? And we love the drama. I think doctors like House cling to objectivity like a three-year-old to a blanket. The only flaw in their argument is that when you have millions of people dying, the correct perspective is to be yelling at the top of your lungs. Have you ever wondered why some people are emotionally driven, passionate like Dr. Seb appears to be, and others seem cold like Dr. House? We see those stark differences daily in life, even if you think just about your coworkers, friends, or family. You can't rationally argue or emotionally reason your way into changing one person type into another. One way we can explain this difference though is intrinsic wiring, which the Myers-Briggs type indicator explains by classifying people as either thinking or feeling. I'd imagine Dr. Seb is a feeling type and House is a thinking type. That doesn't mean House won't feel because he definitely always wants the right thing for his patients, even if he might seem a bit cold about it. Thinking types are generally guarded, defiant and carefree. Feeling types are optimistic, compliant and quite worried. None is superior to another and it's the tension between the two that the best results are found in. Uh, hands a little. Oh, this is getting very spicy. So now he has the pacemaker and he's still collapsing. That means his heart isn't the problem or it is since he's so in love with Cameron that he needs to fake a collapse to skip three dates. I'm still very much fancying our metabolic theories, but let's run down our own differential. Metabolic could be homocysteine remethylation disorders or urea cycle deficits. Hard to detect, can cause blackout, psychiatric symptoms and make him stinky. Inflammatory could be sarcoidosis, a famous TB mimic. Could also be that which should not be named. Starts with L, ends with upus. Degenerative would be unlikely here. Neoplastic could be lymphoma, also a big mimicker of TB. Or a tumor with a paraneoplastic syndrome maybe. Infective could be HIV. HIV, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, neuroparasitic infections like strongyloides or toxicara. So metabolic screen, autoimmune screen, CT, MRI head, sulfur parasites, and blood antibody tests for infectious diseases. That's the type of test order that would need more than one form. Okay, I'm giving myself three guesses this episode of what the diagnosis is. The first two I'll use on tumor, so probably with a paraneoplastic syndrome and urea cycle deficit metabolic disease. What will my last guess be used on? Brain tumor causes dizziness, loss of consciousness. Get an MRI. I have cancer. Felt a lump. See you in an hour or two. I'll go get a nurse. My flat. A lot to go through here. Foreman and House had a bet on the tilt table. Foreman said they'd find nothing and House said they would. So loser had to do clinic duty for a week. Foreman is playing House now and went into the room expecting a totally different patient. Now he's being pushed around, forced not to have a chaperone. Definitely playing with fire there. Always want to have another person present for an intimate examination. It reassures the patient and the doctor that everyone is protected. As a patient, you may not know what is normal to do in an intimate examination. It's also uncomfortable to be getting close to someone else while nobody else is in the room. That's why the rate of complaints during intimate exams with chaperones present is so much lower. For doctors, we might feel that something is routine as well that patients may be very nervous about. For example, we also have to get quite close to a patient while we're looking in the ears or the eyes. For those reasons, I would never do an intimate examination on a female without a chaperone present even if the patient declined having one in the room. Lift your left arm up and under your head. Right there. Yeah. It's nothing. That's what they told Donna. She was dead in six months. Either you do the biopsy or I talk to your superior. 
Dr. House. Although they've made the patient seem totally neurotic here, I'm actually on her side. It is funny that she thinks he's Dr. House though. The implication of missing a breast cancer is huge. So all patients in the UK get sent to a breast clinic to have what we call triple assessment, clinical examination, imaging, and a tissue sample, which we call histology. So we then score each domain from one to five based on how suspicious it is for cancer, and that helps us decide a treatment plan. There's nothing there. Yeah, there is. He's got TB. Well, of course he's got TB. The guy's been in the jungle for 20 years. I did an LP2, low glucose, and he has an increased sed rate. Everything screams tuberculosis. Not everything. He's positive for TB. Or is he? The test Cameron did on him behind House's back is called the Mantu test. You basically get a purified protein from TB called tuberculin and inject it under the skin. The idea is that if the patient is fighting TB at that point in time, you get a reaction. But things like being vaccinated against TB or being infected with mycobacteria, which aren't tuberculosis, can cause a false positive. Also, even if he does have TB, then that could just be the beginning. In real life, it's very unusual to have two new presentations of disease all at the same time, but this is house. So a little more diagnostic spice makes for some tasty watching. I'm still gunning for adult onset metabolic disease. If any of the symptoms are caused by the TB, it would throw off our diagnosis. You're right. We gotta treat the TB. Leave with floxacin. You have a resistant strain of TB. You know, there's parts of the world where you get knifed walking around with this. I never truly appreciated what he's saying here until I went to a refugee camp. 2015, Syrian civil war had been going on for four years and displaced Syrians began accumulating in Calais. It's a port city with access to the UK, which was their primary destination. Calais had poor conditions though, and being just across the border, I felt a responsibility to try and help the people there. We're driving uh, to Calais with a van and we filled it thanks to all of the donations from you guys and co-op boots and um, Tesco have also donated as well. Just one problem, I had zero humanitarian experience. When we arrived to the camp, we opened our van filled with important supplies and got surrounded by the refugees who were understandably desperate for what was inside. Canned foods, clothes, sanitary towels, and new shoes. To stop a riot, we had to close the van and drive off, except refugee camps aren't known for their silky smooth tarmac, so we got the van stuck in a ditch. I think it's much better to show you what's happened rather than explain it. <laughs> We've managed to bury ourselves <laughs> into a pit of sand. And we ended up being the ones needing help. We did get out afterwards and the locals even threw us a party once we learned how to distribute properly. <laughs> See, even with the best intentions, you need a good plan. Also, there's no way Cameron knows he has treatment-resistant TB just from the Mantu test. The sputum culture wouldn't be back yet, so still interesting to watch. 10 grand, cure one person. I had a patient in uh, Johnny once. She had resistant TB. She can afford these. I'm not taking these pills. Maybe somebody will pay a little more attention to my story. What? Okay, Dr. Sebastian just confirmed he's an alien. No human can be this generous. Actually, in all fairness, throughout history, there have been many instances where people have given their lives to save others. Rick Rascoria, for example, a former military officer who led people to safety during the 9-11 attack, but sadly passed away when the towers collapsed. He's thought to have saved over 2,500 people that day. Or Tyler Duhan, who was an eight-year-old boy, woke up finding a camper van on fire, went inside to save six of his relatives by waking them up, allowing them to escape, then realized his grandfather was still in there, went back in to try and lift him out, and got caught in the blaze, sadly passing in the process, trying to carry his grandfather out as an eight-year-old boy. Or 
Nirjad Banot, a flight attendant who refused to give terrorists who hijacked her plane passenger passports belonging to Americans so that they could identify and execute them. That led to many children being able to escape safely, but she gave her own life in the process. She was then awarded the Ashok Chakra, which is the highest award for bravery in the face of an enemy and was the first woman to receive that award in 1986. So maybe there is something about being human that gives some of us the courage to face the ultimate sacrifice to save others. Newsweek's calling it. In my opinion, Dr. Sebastian Charles is an idiot. Yeah, you can quote me. C-U-D-D-Y. Sebastian has called a press conference for three. House is obviously annoyed as his patron patient is refusing treatment for a condition House didn't even want to treat in the first place. I love this episode. Now, the team mentioned the symptoms he still has are night sweats, increased heart rate, and loss of consciousness and said to be pointed to the autonomic nervous system that controls the fight or flight and rest or digest responses, calming you down when things are safe or ramping you up when you're a power lifter being slapped in the face. <laughs> So when these autonomic systems get damaged, then it can cause abnormal heart rate, headache, sweats, loss of consciousness, or going pale. High ammonia levels due to urea cycle metabolic disorders could cause this and the abnormal smells. One thing I'm worried about here is if I'm right and Dr. Sebastian grounds his whole campaign on the fact that he has TB and is sacrificing himself, he would lose all credibility if it's not TB and seem like a fraud. Looks like there's serious action still to come in this episode. So if serious action is your thing, then check out the channel membership. You can get priority reply to comments, early access to new videos, suggesting a non-house series and episode for me to react to. For a limited time only, the first 30 members will have a chance to win a one hour, one-on-one -on -one medical tutor session with me on a topic of your choice. We currently have 25 members with only five spots left. So press join now to secure your spot. You want third world treatment? You got it. Boy, is it hot here in Johnny. You can't demand to be treated like any third world sick person and call a press conference. They treat me special. That doesn't mean I am. House is arguing that Dr. Sebastian is cheapening their suffering by choosing to forego privileges that are so easily accessible to him. But does any of it matter if TB isn't the cause of his symptoms anyway? I tend to disagree with House here as radical change quite frequently requires radical action. Let's take a look at someone who is not very well known called Benjamin Lay. The year is 1738. You're a slave keeper. You're part of a religious group called the Quakers and are having the biggest meeting meeting of the year, Benjamin Lay walks in saying, how can people who profess the golden rule keep slaves? Thus shall God shed the blood of those persons who enslave their fellow creatures. He then lifts a book over his head and stabs through it with a sword, splattering blood on himself and on the slave owners. It wasn't actually blood, it was bright red pokeberry juice and at that point he was disowned and it wasn't until 20 years later that the Quakers began to disown slavery. Later in 1839 they helped form an anti-slavery society which fought for the global abolition of slavery. So Lay was critical with his guerrilla tactics in planting the seeds for that to actually happen. So maybe Dr. Sebastian is the Benjamin Lay of TB? Let's find out. It's all preventable. Another person just died. His internal heating and ventilation should be off. He shouldn't be able to sweat. He should be turning bright red. There is zero way House can make that conclusion. Firstly, as we mentioned, there are two different nerve types in the autonomic nervous system. The ones that control sweating are the sympathetic or fight or flight nerves. So House was assuming it was those that were affected, but then earlier he was saying that the patient had a fast heart rate, which would only happen if it was the rest and digest nerves that were damaged. A bit of inconsistency there, but definitely forgivable. But secondly, even if there were only signs of sympathetic nerves being affected, the patient would almost certainly still be able to sweat. That's because you would need to fully switch off all the functions suddenly, all at once, to make it totally absent, which is very unlikely. With that out of the way, 
the excessive sweating must be a clue. Taking all of the other things into account, hyperhidrosis, irritability, loss of consciousness, my last diagnostic guess is going to be hyperthyroidism. I'm going with that, it's caused by cancer, so paraneoplastic hyperthyroidism. Dr. House, I would appreciate it if you left us alone. Get that out of my face. He's sweating like a pig. Immediate, did they listen? He's disoriented. Oh. They have to hear me. He's having a cardiac arrest. Clear. That is not TV. But that is good TV. We now have our mandatory cardiac arrest, so we can all sleep at night now. In medical dramas, these are done notoriously badly. So common themes are no chest compressions, shocking non-chockable rhythms, although we couldn't actually see what the rhythm was here, giving adrenaline way too early and frequently directly into the heart, which we haven't done for about 50 years, but they didn't do here, so that was pretty good. Also in real life, we have a crash team which consists of intensive care doctors, resource officers, and a porter to run a blood gas who are very helpful people. Although it can get so chaotic in person that we even use a screen to stop other patients in the bay from looking. There also is way grosser than you see here with vomit around and chest compressions cracking ribs. Not exactly as clean as just shocking someone back to life so that they can stretch it off. This could be a diagnostic clue though. I'm excited to find out. still have to explain PR variability, syncope, headaches, and low sugar. Very interesting. So House is saying they've eliminated some of the symptoms by starting TB treatment. It takes at least two weeks for that to happen and Universal rightly put in a little slow sequence before to show the passage of time while he's being treated. Very impressive. So the only symptom on that list that seems quite specific that is still there is low glucose on the lumbar puncture. You see, that is one of the classical signs of tuberculosis, but they're saying this TB is cured here. So what else could be causing it? The sign actually has a medical name called hypoglycorrhachia. Good one for the spelling bee. It can also be caused by bacterial or fungal meningitis, neurosyphilis, neurosarcoidosis, toxoplasmosis, or a brain tumor. So I think my tumor option is definitely getting more likely. What else could cause low CSF sugar? And it's not a tumor because the CT and the MRI were both negative. Which just leaves tumor. So small we can't see it. The Cidio Blastoma. Easily removed by surgery. What? So tumor was my first guess. Nicidioblastoma is a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas that secretes insulin, which leads to low blood sugar. So I wasn't quite right with the paraneoplastic syndrome since for that, it needs to produce active substances not related to their organ of origin. Insulin does come from the pancreas. I'm still counting that though, as it was within my three guesses. Do you think it counts? Answers down below. In real life, this again would have been picked up way earlier thanks to that porter that I was talking about because they would have run a blood gas that would have showed us the low glucose during the cardiac arrest. We would have seen the low glucose because of the high insulin secreted by that tumor. That could have triggered us to look further and believe it or not, this is a rare but not unheard of condition. Now chop it out and let's send our patron to do some work. We're gonna inject calcium into your pancreas. If you're too many beta cells because of a tumor, your blood sugar will drop precipitously. It's starting to drop. This is a genuine diagnostic test for insulinoma, which nicidioblastoma is a subtype. It's called a selective arterial calcium stimulation test. You can check for more than four times insulin increase in the right hepatic vein when the calcium is infused into the splenic artery. 75% of cases of insulinoma can be diagnosed via ultrasound CT or with a contrast study. And the other 25% need to be diagnosed like this. The the reason why it works so well is that calcium stimulates the release of insulin from the tumor cells, but not the normal human beta cells. That's probably because of an upregulation of calcium sensing receptors in insulinomas. Now they just have to stop him dying from low glucose. Give him some sugar. I'm sure Cameron will volunteer. He's seizing. Push an amp of D50. Do I kill the guy? Congratulations. You have a tumor. You actually like working for house? You find this satisfying? 
I saved his life. So I get credit for every life he saves from here on out. He lives! Ready to bask in the media attention of another day, I say while making a video for YouTube. Really enjoyed this episode. 9 out of 10 entertainment, 6 out of 10 accuracy, 8.5 out of 10 diagnosis. Very, very good. This episode makes way more sense so when you watch the previous one where House battles to save Cuddy's roofer after her slip up. 